In history of organized crime, a select few figures stand out for their ruthlessness, cunning, and sheer audacity. Among them, the Jewish mafia bosses had the power and influence to control the underworld. From the streets of New York City to the neon-lit casinos of Las Vegas, these individuals ruled and created history. This is the most dangerous Jewish mafia bosses in history. Lepke Buchalter. In the streets of Manhattan, a notorious figure was born on February 6, 1897. His name was Louis Buchalter, but many knew him by Louis Lepke Buchalter. Louis grew up in a family of five children, with dreams that diverged greatly from his siblings. While one became a dentist, another pursued academia as a college professor and rabbi, and the third delved into the world of pharmaceuticals. But Louis had a different path laid out before him. After his father passed away when he was just 12 years old, Louis found himself in the streets of New York City, selling theatrical goods to make ends meet. Despite the hardships, he never lost sight of his education, excelling academically at the Rabbi Jacob Joseph School. However, his life took a darker turn when he was arrested for burglary and assault in 1915 at the age of 18. Yet, luck seemed to be on his side as the case was discharged, but Tribble followed him, and in 1916 he found himself behind bars once again, this time in Connecticut on burglary charges. Sent to the Cheshire Reformatory for Juvenile Offenders, Lewis spent a year there before returning to New York City. His return, however, did not mark the end of his criminal endeavors. In 1917, Louis was sentenced to Sing Sing for grand larceny, followed by another stint in 1920 for attempted burglary, but prison bars couldn't confine his ambition. Upon his release in 1922, Louis reunited with his childhood friend, Jacob Gura Shapiro. Together, they embarked on a path that would cement their names in the mafia history. They seized control of garment industry unions through coercion and extortion, establishing a protection racket. Louis's power only grew when he forged an alliance with Tommy Lucchese, a formidable figure in the Lucchese crime family. Together, they tightened their grip on the garment district, ruling it with an iron fist. However, notoriety often comes at a price. In 1927, Louis and Shapiro found themselves in hot water when they were arrested for the murder of Jacob Organ, also known as Little Augie, and the attempted murder of Jack Diamond. Yet, fate smiled upon them once more as the charges were dropped due to insufficient evidence. As Louis Buchalter's power expanded in the early 1930s, so too did his methods for maintaining control. With a shrewd mind and a knack for strategy, he devised a system that would revolutionize the way contract killings were carried out for Cosa Nostra mobsters. This system became infamous as Murder Inc. Teaming up with his partner Albert Anastasia, Buchalter established a streamlined process. Anastasia would act as the intermediary, receiving contract requests from the mobsters and passing them along to Buchalter. It was Buchalter who would then handpick individuals from Brooklyn street gangs, carefully selecting those with no ties to major crime families. This approach ensured that if any of the hired killers were caught, the mobsters themselves remained shielded from direct involvement. Under Buchalter's command, Murder Inc. orchestrated a string of assassinations across the nation. These hired hands not only carried out the contracts for Cosa Nostra, but also fulfilled Buchalter's own orders. One such high-profile hit was the assassination of Dutch Schultz in 1935, when Schultz's plans to eliminate New York District Attorney Thomas Dewey drew the ire of the National Crime Syndicate. It was Buchalter who executed the deadly task. By 1935, Buchalter and his partner, Jacob Shapiro, had amassed a formidable army of around 250 men. Their various racketeering operations in New York City, spanning industries from trucking to baking to garments, raked in over $1 million annually. Buchalter even owned a swanky nightclub in Manhattan, known as the Rio Bamba, where the city's elite rubbed shoulders under his watchful eye. However, the seeds of Buchalter's downfall were sown in 1936. Murder Inc.'s ruthless efficiency turned against them when they targeted Joseph Rosen, a Brooklyn candy store owner who dared to defy Buchalter's demands. His refusal cost him his life, and it sparked the beginning of the end for Buchalter. In November 1936, Buchalter and Shapiro faced justice when they were convicted of violating federal antitrust laws, but they wouldn't go down without a fight. While out on bail, they vanished into the shadows, evading capture. Their act of defiance only served to intensify the manhunt that followed. Buchalter remained a fugitive until his dramatic surrender to none other than FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover in August 1939. He had been hiding in plain sight in New York City all along. Yet surrender didn't spell the end of his legal troubles. Convicted of federal narcotics trafficking charges, Buchalter found himself facing even harsher consequences. Sentenced to 30 years to life in state prison in 1940, he was shipped off to Leavenworth Federal Penitentiary to serve his time. But even behind bars, Buchalter's troubles weren't over. 
He was indicted for murder in Los Angeles in 1940, although he never faced trial for this charge. As Louis Bukhalter's criminal empire crumbled, the long arm of justice finally caught up with him. On May 9, 1941, he faced arraignment in a New York state court for the 1936 murder of Joseph Rosen, among other charges. The turning point came when mobster Abe Relis, who had turned state's evidence in 1940, implicated Bukhalter in four murders, including Rosen's. Returned from Leavenworth Federal Prison to Brooklyn for trial, Bukhalter found himself ensnared further by damning testimony from Albert TikTok Tannenbaum. Despite the immediate appeal launched by his lawyers, Bukhalter's fate was sealed on November 30, 1941, when he was found guilty of first-degree murder. Just two days later, on December 2, 1941, he and his lieutenants Emmanuel Mendy Weiss and Louis Capone were sentenced to death. The legal battle raged on. In October 1942, the New York Court of Appeals voted narrowly to uphold Bukhalter's conviction and death sentence, despite dissenting voices advocating for a new trial due to errors in jury instructions and insufficient evidence. Bukhalter's case eventually ascended to the United States Supreme Court, where his conviction was affirmed in 1943 by a resounding vote. With all avenues of appeal exhausted, Bukhalter faced the grim reality of his impending fate. Despite serving a separate racketeering sentence at Leavenworth Federal Prison, New York State authorities demanded Bukhalter's transfer for execution. On January 21, 1944, federal agents handed him over, and he was swiftly transported to Sing Sing Prison. In the face of impending doom, Bukhalter made desperate pleas for mercy, but they fell on deaf ears. On March 4, 1944, he met his end in the unforgiving embrace of the electric chair at Sing Sing. There were no final words, only the silence of a man who had lived and died by the sword of his own making. Meyer Lansky A young boy named Meyer Lansky arrived with his family from the Russian Empire in 1911. They settled in the Lower East Side of New York City, a neighborhood teeming with immigrants and opportunity, but also with its fair share of hardships. Growing up in this tough environment, Lansky quickly learned ways of the streets. He formed close bonds with other young boys like Benjamin Bugsy Siegel and Charles Lucky Luciano. Little did they know these friendships would shape the course of their lives and the history of organized crime in America. As they grew older, Lansky, Siegel, and Luciano found themselves drawn into the underworld of bootlegging during Prohibition. They saw an opportunity to make money in the illegal liquor trade, and they seized it with both hands. Together, they formed the notorious Bugs and Meyer mob, known for its ruthlessness and violence. But Lansky and Luciano's partnership went beyond just bootlegging. They shared a vision of organizing the various criminal factions in America into a cohesive unit. Alongside other key figures, they laid the groundwork for what would become known as the National Crime Syndicate. Lansky was a mastermind when it came to finances. He saw the potential in the burgeoning gambling industry and set out to build a global empire. From the bright lights of Las Vegas to the exotic shores of Cuba and the Bahamas, Lansky's influence stretched far and wide. He even had interests in casinos as far away as London. But Lansky's true genius lay in his ability to launder money and utilize offshore banking. In 1932, he introduced these techniques to the criminal underworld, revolutionizing the way organized crime operated. By the 1950s, these methods would prove invaluable, especially in the heroin trade. Despite his involvement in organized crime for nearly half a century, Lansky managed to evade serious legal consequences. While others around him faced convictions for various crimes, Lansky himself was only ever convicted of illegal gambling. Lansky's friendship with Luciano was a cornerstone of his life. It began in their teenage years when Luciano attempted to extort protection money from Lansky. Instead of cowering in fear, Lansky stood his ground, earning Luciano's respect and forging a bond that would last a lifetime. Together with Siegel and other associates like Arnold Rothstein, Lansky and Luciano became central figures in the criminal underworld. They navigated through shifting alliances, turf wars, and betrayals, always staying one step ahead of their rivals. Their empire was not without its challenges. The law was always on their trail, and internal disputes threatened to tear their syndicate apart. Yet through it all, Lansky remained the steady hand at the helm, guiding their operations with a keen eye for profit and a ruthless determination to succeed. Lansky was a pioneer in money laundering, using Swiss offshore accounts and exploiting Switzerland's secrecy laws to hide illicit earnings. By 1932, Lansky had already set up this system, laying the groundwork for decades of financial maneuvering. Expanding his gambling operations became Lansky's focus. By 1936, he had moved into Florida and Cuba, leveraging his technical expertise and mob connections to ensure success. Known for his integrity, Lansky ran his gambling establishments, or carpet joints, with strict adherence to fair play, avoiding any suspicions of rigged games. 
World War II brought new challenges and opportunities for Lansky. He and his gang disrupted pro-Nazi rallies in New York, showing their allegiance to their country. Lansky's biggest wartime coup came when he brokered a deal with the U.S. government for Lucky Luciano's release from prison in exchange for mafia security for warships in New York Harbor. After the war, Lansky shifted his focus to Las Vegas. He convinced the Italian-American mafia to entrust Bugsy Siegel with managing the Flamingo Hotel, becoming a major investor himself. However, when Siegel faced financial losses, Lansky intervened to save him from assassination. Yet, as losses mounted, Lansky reluctantly approved Siegel's elimination. Following Siegel's death, Lansky's associates took control of the Flamingo, maintaining Lansky's financial interests. But Lansky wasn't done expanding his reach. He played a significant role in the Havana Conference of 1946, solidifying mafia control over Cuba's casinos and racetracks through a partnership with Fulgencio Batista. Lansky's ties to Batista deepened over the years. He offered bribes to ensure Batista's return to power in 1952, further cementing mafia control over Cuban gambling operations. However, the tide turned against Lansky with the Cuban Revolution in 1959. Fleeing to the Bahamas, he sought compensation for his losses from the U.S. government. But Lansky's troubles didn't end there. Allegations surfaced of his involvement in blackmail, using compromising photographs of former FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover to gain influence. Lansky attempted to evade federal tax evasion charges in 1970 by fleeing to Israel, but was deported back to the U.S. He stood trial in 1973, where testimony from loan shark Vincent Fat Vinny, Teresa, led to his acquittal. As Meyer Lansky settled into retirement in Miami Beach, Florida, the once powerful figure of organized crime appeared to fade into obscurity. Living quietly for the last decade of his life, Lansky passed away on January 15, 1983, at the age of 80. Despite his notorious reputation, Lansky's wealth seemed to dwindle as he aged. When he died, his assets on paper showed almost nothing, perplexing those who had followed his life of crime. The FBI suspected he had stashed away over $300 million in hidden bank accounts, equivalent to a staggering $744 million in today's currency. Yet, no trace of this wealth was ever found. Lansky struggled to afford health care for his handicapped son, who tragically passed away in poverty. Upon Lansky's death, his widow and family members were shocked to discover that he left behind only $57,000 in cash, equivalent to $141,000 in today's money. Lansky himself admitted to losing nearly all of his fortune in Cuba, where his lucrative ventures came crashing down, leaving him to lament, I crapped out. Arnold Rothstein Once upon a time in Manhattan, there lived a boy named Arnold Rothstein. His parents, Abraham and Esther, were well off, and Arnold grew up in comfort. His father was known as Abe the Just, a respected businessman in the Jewish community. Arnold had an older brother who was on the path to becoming a rabbi, but Arnold was different. From a young age, Arnold showed remarkable talent in math, but he wasn't like other kids. He found school boring and often got into trouble. People described him as a difficult child because he didn't like following rules. Arnold also felt jealous of his older brother's attention. He wanted to be noticed, to be in the spotlight. Arnold had a secret passion, gambling. Even though his father didn't approve, Arnold loved the thrill of taking risks. He saw gambling as a way to break free and have some excitement in his life. As he grew up, Arnold's gambling skills became legendary. By the time he was 28, he moved to the bustling Tenderloin District of Manhattan. There, he opened a big casino, becoming a major player in the city's underground gambling scene. But Arnold didn't stop there. He had his eye on the world of horse racing. He invested in a racetrack in Havre de Grace, Maryland, and rumors swirled that he manipulated races to win big. Arnold was a master at playing the odds and making sure things went his way. Arnold was no ordinary gambler. He was smart and cunning. He knew how to get information others couldn't. He had a vast network of people feeding him tips, thanks to his father's connections in the banking world. Arnold was willing to pay top dollar for valuable information, and it paid off big time. Thanks to his gambling skills and strategic investments, Arnold became incredibly wealthy. By the time he was just 30 years old, he was a millionaire. But with great wealth came great danger. Arnold's success made him enemies, and he knew he had to be careful. As Arnold Rothstein's gambling empire grew, so did his reputation. But with great success came great scrutiny. In 1919, Rothstein found himself at the center of one of the biggest scandals in sports history, the Black Sox scandal. It was the World Series and the Chicago White Sox were facing off against the Cincinnati Reds. Rumors swirled that Rothstein's agents had paid members of the White Sox to throw the games, ensuring a big payday for Rothstein by betting against them. Authorities investigated, and Rothstein was called to testify before a grand jury. But despite suspicions, 
No direct evidence tying him to the scandal was found. Rothstein maintained his innocence, claiming he had refused to participate once he learned of the scheme. However, some versions of the story suggest Rothstein might have initially turned down the opportunity, but later reconsidered. He could have collaborated with notorious gamblers like Joseph Sport Sullivan and Abe Attell. While Rothstein may not have orchestrated the fix, there were whispers that he may have bet on the series with inside knowledge, potentially winning a hefty sum. Legal proceedings against the players involved in the scandal resulted in dismissals and bans from Major League Baseball, but the allegations of a fixed series and Rothstein's involvement remained unproven. Despite the controversy, Rothstein pressed on with his ventures. He even owned a racehorse named Sporting Blood, which brought him further attention in the racing world. In 1921, Sporting Blood competed in the prestigious Travers Stakes. Rothstein's horse won, but not without suspicion. Allegations surfaced that Rothstein had conspired with his trainer, Sam Hildreth, to manipulate the odds in his favor. The plan, as some claimed, involved entering another horse, Grey Lag, to drive up the betting odds on Sporting Blood. Then, just before the race, Grey Lag was scratched, leaving Sporting Blood as the favorite and Rothstein with a windfall. However, despite the allegations, no concrete evidence of a conspiracy was ever found. Arnold Rothstein ventured into new territories with the onset of prohibition. Seeing the potential for immense profit, Rothstein dabbled in bootlegging and the narcotics trade. He didn't just stick to one method. Rothstein was a master at diversifying his operations. He smuggled liquor along the Hudson River and from Canada into upstate New York. He even got into the speakeasy business, providing people with illegal alcohol during the dry years. But Rothstein wasn't satisfied with just that. He became the first to illegally import Scotch whiskey, using his own fleet of freighters to bring in the precious liquid. Rothstein was a man of many talents, and one of his greatest skills was his ability to control politics and crime. He leveraged his banking connections and political ties to gain control over street gangs in New York City. Names like Meyer Lansky, Jack Legs Diamond, Charles Lucky Luciano, and Dutch Schultz all fell under his influence. He acted as a mediator between rival gangs, charging hefty fees for his services, and much of his business was conducted in plain sight. By 1925, Rothstein was at the height of his power and wealth, reportedly worth over $10 million. But every empire has its downfall. On November 4, 1928, Rothstein's life came to a sudden end. He was shot during a business meeting at Manhattan's Park Central Hotel. Rumors swirled that it was over unpaid gambling debts from a fixed poker game. The circumstances of his death remain shrouded in mystery. Some say it was George Hump McManus. Others point fingers at Dutch Schultz. But regardless of who pulled the trigger, Rothstein's demise led to the unraveling of his criminal empire. Former associates scrambled to claim their piece of the pie, dividing up Rothstein's enterprises. Ten years after his death, Rothstein's once vast fortune disappeared, declared insolvent by his own brother, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel. Born to a struggling Ashkenazi Jewish family, Benjamin Bugsy Siegel grew up in the rough neighborhood of Williamsburg. Life wasn't easy for him, and he found himself drawn to the excitement of the streets from an early age. Skipping school, Ben joined a gang in Manhattan, where his journey into the world of crime began. Starting with petty thefts, he soon graduated to more serious offenses like armed robbery and even more sinister acts like rape and murder. But amidst the chaos of his criminal life, Ben found a friend in Meyer Lansky, a bond that would shape his future. Together, they formed a small gang known as the Bugs and Mayer Mob. Their activities ranged from bootlegging during Prohibition to offering their services as hitmen to other cream families. Ben was known for his daring nature and quick thinking in dangerous situations, earning him a reputation in New York City's underworld. In 1929, Siegel attended the Atlantic City Conference representing his gang. This event marked his entry into the big leagues of organized crime, where he rubbed shoulders with the likes of Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello. As tensions rose in the Castellamarese War, Ben allegedly played a role in the assassinations of mob bosses Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. With Maranzano's death, Ben and Lansky helped establish the National Crime Syndicate, aiming to bring order to the chaotic world of organized crime. They were instrumental in the formation of Murder Incorporated, but not all was smooth sailing for Siegel. He found himself in conflicts with rivals like the Fabrizio brothers, leading to deadly consequences. In 1935, he was implicated in the assassination of Lone Shark brothers, Louis and Joseph Amberg. Despite his criminal exploits, Ben only faced one conviction for gambling and vagrancy in Miami. Outside of his criminal endeavors, Ben lived a life of luxury. He owned properties in prestigious locations like the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, and a lavish Tudor home in Scarsdale, New York. He mingled with high society, counting figures like Al Capone among his associates, and was a fixture in New York City's nightlife scene. In the late 1930s, 
Siegel made a bold move, leaving behind the dangers of the East Coast for the promise of California's sun-soaked shores. With Jack Dragna, the boss of the Los Angeles crime family by his side, Siegel set up shop in the West. Together, they ventured into syndicate-sanctioned gambling rackets, with Siegel hand-picking Mickey Cohen as his right-hand man. Backed by the influence of Lansky and Luciano, Siegel quickly asserted his dominance in the Los Angeles underworld. To cover his illicit earnings, Siegel claimed involvement in legal gambling ventures like Santa Anita Park, all the while controlling the underground operations beneath the surface. He expanded his reach further, taking control of the city's numbers racket and facilitating a lucrative drug trade route from Mexico. But Siegel's ambitions didn't stop there. He dabbled in offshore casinos, ran a prostitution ring, and cultivated relationships with influential figures across various industries. In Hollywood, he rubbed elbows with the elite, befriending stars like George Raft and Clark Gable, and even buying up prime real estate in Beverly Hills. In Hollywood, he flexed his muscle by controlling trade unions and staging strikes to extort movie studios. He wasn't afraid to borrow hefty sums from celebrities either, racking up over $400,000 in loans. Within his first year in Tinseltown, Siegel's connections stretched beyond Hollywood glamour. He attempted to streak deals with fascist leaders, including Mussolini, and even met with high-ranking Nazis like Hermann Göring and Joseph Goebbels. Siegel's penchant for the extravagant led him down a dangerous path. He claimed to possess a groundbreaking explosive substance dubbed atomite, attracting interest from Mussolini and the Axis powers. However, his failure to demonstrate its effectiveness left him facing demands for refunds and embroiled in legal battles. Siegel's downfall started with his involvement in the murder of Harry Greenberg, thrusting Siegel into a high-profile trial in 1941. Despite mounting evidence against him, including revelations of his criminal past in newspapers, Siegel managed to wriggle free, acquitted due to what some saw as insufficient evidence. Yet the spotlight on Siegel only intensified, media scrutiny grew, and he found himself facing more legal troubles, including an arrest for bookmaking. But once again, with the support of celebrity witnesses and his network of influence, Siegel managed to evade the grasp of justice. As Benjamin Siegel's story unfolded, he sought to pivot from his criminal past towards legitimacy. In 1946, he glimpsed an opportunity for reinvention through a partnership with William R. Wilkerson's Flamingo Hotel. Siegel had long harbored ambitions in Southern Nevada, even leaving operations in the capable hands of Mo Sedway during the 1930s. With the Flamingo, Siegel envisioned a grand establishment, combining gambling, entertainment, and luxury accommodations to rival the best in the world. However, realizing his vision came with challenges. He coerced Wilkerson into selling his shares, consolidating syndicate control over the Flamingo, but also earning himself enemies in the process. Undeterred by obstacles, Siegel embarked on a spending spree, demanding the finest construction materials despite post-war shortages. The costs soared far beyond initial estimates, with expenses exceeding $6 million by 1947, a staggering sum at the time. Siegel's reputation for violence and erratic behavior unsettled contractors and associates. The road to success was rocky. The Flamingo faced setbacks during its opening, operating at a loss due to construction delays and operational issues. Siegel, however, was not one to accept defeat. He hired a publicist, made renovations, and eventually turned a profit by March 1947. But tragedy loomed on the horizon. On June 20, 1947, Siegel's life was cut short in a hail of bullets at his Beverly Hills home. The motive behind his murder remains shrouded in mystery, with theories ranging from financial disputes within the mob to personal vendettas. Today, Benjamin Siegel is remembered both in the Bialystoker Synagogue in New York and with a plaque at the Flamingo Las Vegas, commemorating his lasting impact on the city's evolution.